I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It is not arrogant. Or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but it rejoices with truth. Love bears all things. <laughs> Believes all things. Hopes all things. endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. 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 You know, I, I, I've seen that video intro video to this uh, sermon uh, at least 20 or 30 times. And I love it every time. I never grow tired of it. And really, there's two reasons for that. First is, those are people from our own church, some of you. And I know and love all of them. And the second reason is the power of what they're reading, what they're reciting. This chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, which we, over the last five weeks, have been making our way through, is so incredible. I've, I've read it, heard it read, uh, recited it, spoke it at weddings as a pastor for years, but I'm learning to understand it and apply it in a, in a whole new way, and we hope that you are as well. Um, now, if you've been tracking along with us in this series, this will not come as a surprise to you, but it might come as some review. If, but if you're joining in, if you're finding us online, or you've been invited, or you're, you're new, you can go back and watch all these sermons. But I just want to let you know, this was a letter, a chapter in a letter. Now, Paul, the Apostle Paul, didn't write 1 Corinthians in, in chapters, we added those later. He wrote a letter, like you write letters. I'm guessing you don't put chapters in your letters if you write letters. Um, it'd be weird if you did. But he wrote a letter. But this section of the letter is kind of like this uh, ode to love. We hear it as this great poem, this great uh, high, profound, uh, soaring description of what love is like. But that is not how the Corinthians, uh, the church in Corinth would have heard it. I guarantee you, when they heard this letter read publicly, and by the way, that's how it worked. The letter was sent to them. When they received it, it would have been read out loud in a church service. When they heard it read, they did not sit there going, oh, how, how inspiring. Oh, we should print that on our wall at home, honey, when we get there. We should write that on cards. We should carve that in stone. No, I think they squirmed. I think it, it convicted them because Paul was not writing it to describe what they were doing, but to call them out on what they were not doing, how they were not living. And before we get all inspired, we also have to look inside and say, what, what does this letter and this part of this letter have to say to me that would make me squirm a bit, that would challenge me, that would point out some things that God wants different in my life and in your life as well. So let's, let's pause and pray and ask God to do just that. Father God, we come to you now and we believe that your word says it's living and active, it's sharper than a double-edged sword. It's able to penetrate our thoughts, our attitudes, and our souls. We don't always like that, but we need that. So we ask you to speak to us and penetrate through the things that might be in the way. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So this is what Paul's getting at uh, in, in verses one through three, when he says, you can, be a, you can be successful, you can be effective, you can be powerful, you can be impressive. Without love, you amount to nothing. He's describing the Corinthian church, wealthy, successful, impressive, and in many ways, outwardly effective. And I think he's also describing the church in America in some ways. Without love, you, can, you amount to nothing. It comes to nothing. He's giving the Corinthian church and us a picture of all the things they're not yet and all the things that Jesus is. 
We'll come to that as we go. But here in this final paragraph, which I want to read for us, Paul's uh, throwing in another stinging rebuke. It's easy to miss, but I don't want us to miss it. I'm just going to read verses 11 and 12 of 1 Corinthians 13. 11 and 12. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, and then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Boy, there's so much in those two verses, those two sentences. Do you hear what Paul's saying to the church in Corinth and to, the, to us today? He's saying, when I was a child, I acted like a child, but when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. The implication is you're acting like children. He's calling them babies. He's saying you're acting like little babies. So we'll have to illustrate that. Spiritually speaking, he says, you might be impressive on the outside. Everyone might be impressed with what you're doing and, and all the things that you're accomplishing. But actually, you're like little babies. Your behavior shows it and your thinking shows it. Spiritually speaking, you're not much different than infants. They're, they're the crying baby. This is, this is what Paul's saying to them, and he's saying it to us in a way. Spiritually speaking, though other people are impressed with you, you're like infants. You're like little children, and we have, you need to grow up because it's the nature of love to grow up. Love, by its very nature and definition, grows up. It is the nature of love to grow up. And Paul is saying you, Corinthians, and us, need to grow up. Now, if I say that to you, that sounds mildly offensive. You need to grow up. Grow up, will you? Start acting like an adult. That sounds offensive, but spiritually speaking, that's exactly what we need and what this text is saying to us. We have to grow up into love. Stop being babies, in other words. We all start out as spiritual infants. So Paul's not just rebuking them. He's not just shaming them. He's also encouraging and urging them to be different, because we all start out as spiritual babies. What that means is, when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, whatever age that is, and you, it might be later in life, you might have a PhD, you might be a professor in a, in a university, you might have uh, you know, multiple degrees, you might be wealthy and, and run your own business, but spiritually speaking, you come to Jesus and you come as a baby. You come as an infant. You need to grow up. And that's hard. And, and, and frankly, the longer we go, the more impressed with ourselves we become, the more ac accomplished we are, the more we think we have it figured out, and we're trying to add Jesus into our already well-accomplished and mature life. And the, the scripture says, actually, no. You've got to start over as a baby, as an infant, and you need to grow. This is actually, by the way, the theme of Paul's letter, uh, the theme of the New Testament, Paul's letter. In, in verse 1, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1, earlier in the, in the third chapter of this letter, he says, I could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. He says, when I first came to you, I couldn't even talk to you like adults. I had to talk to you like little kids. Because you weren't even, and he goes on to say, you were not ready for solid food. I couldn't give you solid food. You don't give a baby a big piece of prime rib. Uh, it's a waste of prime rib <laughs> because they can't eat it. You give them milk. He said, I had to give you milk. What does he mean? He means I had to talk to you as little kids because you weren't even ready for the immature stuff yet. You know, years ago when I was a, a football coach, I volunteered as a football coach in, in, in Batavia High School, and I coached the defensive line uh, on the varsity, and I had a blast doing it. Met lots of great students and athletes and parents and coaches and really enjoyed it. Uh, one, I remember one season we had this young man. He was a freshman in high school, but he was six foot four and 260 pounds, so he looked like a giant grown man, and he wasn't fat. I mean, he was, he was, a, he was a little kid in a grown man's body, and he was on the varsity as a freshman. He, just, he had just turned 15, and he he was and actually so much potential, but he didn't know anything. And I, and I have to have to remind myself to talk to him like he didn't know anything because he looked like he you know, was a, could kill everybody. And I remember one time in a game, I had told him over and over again in practice, now, on this play, you've got to go outside the guard. If you don't know what a guard is, that's okay. He didn't either. Uh, and I, and I, he said, okay, okay, coach, okay, coach. He'd go in there. He did it wrong. I'm like, oh, it comes off. I'm like, listen, on this play, you've got to go outside the guard. Okay, coach, okay, coach. He went back in there, went the wrong way again. Three or four times, finally, I grabbed him by the face mask. I said, listen to me. On this play, you've got to go outside the guard. And he went, uh, coach, which one's the guard? 
<laughs> he didn't know. He didn't know where to go. And I reminded me, like, even I was treating him like an adult. And I needed to talk to him in simple terms. In a way, Paul is saying here, I, have, I had to start out addressing you as children, because that's what you were. You know, I remember when, <laughs> saying to one of my children one time, God is happy when we share. And <laughs> this child of mine said, but I'm not. <laughs> it's a childlike answer. Now remember, the Corinthians are wealthy, they're successful, they're educated people, but spiritually speaking, they're babies, they're infants, they need to grow up. We tend to assume in our culture that wealthy people, that successful people, that educated people, that people that that on the outside look impressive must be the mature people, should be the ones that we follow and emulate, but not necessarily so. They haven't grown up into love. And in, verse, in, in chapter 14, for one chapter later from 1 Corinthians 13, in verse 20, Paul writes, Brothers and sisters, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. Paul's saying one of the ways that we grow, one of the key ways that you grow is not just physically, physiologically or biologically, it's in the way that you think. He says, so be, do not be infants in your thinking. What does he mean there? He means in the way that you think about the world, that you process information, information, you should be mature, but be infants when it comes to evil. What does that mean? Innocence when it comes to evil and wickedness and sin is a sign of maturity. This is what Jesus meant when he says we should be as wise as serpent, but as innocent as doves. So in other words, he says in our thinking, in the way that we think about and view the world, we need to grow up. So spiritually speaking, we are childish in our thoughts. This is precisely what Paul gets at when he, in verse, uh, verse 11, chapter 13, verse 11, when he says, when I was a child, I thought like a child. I spoke like a child, and I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put childish things away. That's what he's getting at. Romans 12, verse 2, Paul wrote this letter to the Roman church, and he said, we should be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Thinking different. Spiritual maturity begins in how you think, in how you view the world, in how you understand yourself and others. This is what he's getting at. God isn't satisfied to leave us as little babies. He wants to grow us up, and you shouldn't be satisfied with spiritual infancy either. Moms and dads know this. When your child is born, they have something called the APGAR score, A-P-G-A-R. I think it stands for uh, uh, like a... I don't remember all, the, all of them, but appearance and uh, respiration. And I know the G is for grimace, which I, I, I always think of grimace from the McDonald's commercials in the, in the early 80s, but it means like your reaction to stimulus. But you, these, four, these five things, they test an infant's uh, vitality and health. And you need to score, there's two points for each one, so out of 10, you need to score a nine or better to be a thriving, healthy child. What kind of parent would you be, moms and dads, if your son got just a two or your daughter just got a three on the APGAR? You thought, well, that's not too bad. No, you want to see them thrive in every way. Well, your heavenly father is like that as well. He's not satisfied that you stay immature, a little baby, in your thinking, in your behavior. He wants to grow you up. It's his purpose. That's what he's after with you. Now, it does sound offensive to say grow up, but you need to. And so do I. So do we. There's nothing wrong in starting out as a child. The pathology comes, the problem comes when you stay that way, when you stay stuck that way. This is the problem. It's cute when you're a four-year-old to think like a child, but it's, it's a problem when you're 40, even dangerous and destructive. So let's consider in what ways do we stay stuck as spiritual children? How do we, in our mind, stay stuck as spiritual children? Let's consider how that looks. Paul says, when I became a man, I grew up, I put childish ways behind me. So how are we childish in our thinking? Well, there's lots of things we could say, but I think you could boil it down to one central characteristic that isn't good of being a young child. And you probably already know where I'm going with this. What's the central characteristic of of childishness that we should grow out of, that we need to leave behind? As Paul says, put away, put behind us. It's selfishness. Children are naturally selfish. 
Moms and dads, I'm guessing you didn't have to tell your son or daughter how to say the word mine. You had to teach them how to be others-focused, and that takes time, takes a lifetime. They sort of naturally knew how to take what they wanted and be selfish. Children have a worldview with themselves at the center. They, they see that everything else is revolving around them. So, you know, family, friends, school, and if you get a job, work, and whatever else, it all revolves around you. You make room for God. He's one of these little orbit circles. You make room for your friends and family, but really you're at the center of your worldview. Now, by the way, I think you can, we can all admit that this is not just true for biological children, but for adult children as well. We know lots of grown-ups who behave this way. Sometimes I behave this way. I see everything is revolving around me. I don't want to, but it's true. And that's the primary characteristic, I think, that Paul's saying we need to grow out of in our thinking, to leave behind. Now, again, that's understandable in a four-year-old, but it's not cool if you're 40 or 50 or 30 or 20. Now, interestingly, uh, this is a little aside, in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus has this fascinating encounter with his disciples. And let me give you the context. They are arguing, his 12 closest friends, over who's going to be the greatest when Jesus comes into the kingdom. When he, when he overthrows Rome and brings in the kingdom, they're thinking about actual material political kingdom, and they're wrestling and arguing about their positions of authority and power and prestige once that happens. And they're debating who's going to be the greatest, who will sit in what seat of honor. Jesus overhears this and recognizes that they are like babies in their thinking. They're thinking like little kids. They're not getting at all what his kingdom is about. And he wants to demonstrate to them what the kingdom really is like. And this is what he does. The text says in Matthew 18 that he calls a little child over and has this little child stand among him. That's fascinating to me. Jesus calls out a little little child. Hey, Johnny. Although it would have been Johnny because he's a little Jewish boy. Hey, Joshua. You know, whatever. Come over here. Runs over. Maybe can you see a little dirt on his face and snotty nose? Maybe he's standing there, a little kid, a little toddler. And Jesus has him stand there. Maybe he puts his hands on the little child and says to his disciples, unless you change and become like this little child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoa. What does he mean by that? What does that mean? I thought Paul said we put childish things behind us. Is Jesus and, are Jesus and Paul at odds here? Not at all. There's a difference between childish and childlike. Jesus is saying we need to become like children in a certain way, childlike. But that's not the same thing as saying we should be childish. What Paul's saying we should leave behind. So what are the characteristics of childlikeness that we should hold on to or recover if we've lost them. Well, we could list a lot of them. Children have a sense of wonder and awe. Children are innocent most of the time. Children are naturally trusting. We could go on and on and on here. They have a childlike faith. This is what I think Jesus is saying. You've lost something you need to recover. And Paul's saying, you've grown out of something. You you need to grow out of something you're holding on to. In my experience as a pastor, in my own life, looking at my kids, in my own soul, here's what I think often happens to us. We grow out of the things we should hold on to. We lose a sense of awe and wonder and joy and innocence and trust. We become jaded and cynical with life. We get wounded by other people or disappointed in life, and we lose those childlike qualities that are so good and necessary for a life of faith. But we hold on to the childishness of having ourselves at the center. We do exactly the opposite of what God is calling us to in love. We hold on to childishness and we grow out of childlikeness. We ought to, we need to, God is calling us to. So part of growing up means to recover something of childlikeness. Jesus says, unless you change, meaning there's something wrong with you. Growing up means to recover something that was once lost and see it in a new way. This is precisely with the whole theme of the Bible. We have a society full of eight-year-olds trying to act like 18-year-olds and 18, 28, 38, and 58-year-olds behaving like eight-year-olds. You see it all around us. The goal of spiritual growth is maturity in Christ. That's the goal. That's where God is bringing us, to maturity in Christ. So we might draw it this way. If childish 
is to have self at the center, then to be spiritually mature means Jesus radically changes that. He replaces the self with his identity, with a whole new identity. And we have Christ at the center. We're formed into his image. This is what the Apostle Paul means in Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, when he says, My little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. My little children. Paul addresses the Galatian Christians as little children, not just the Corinthian Christians, little children. I am longing for you to grow up into the image of Jesus. Christ formed in you. That's the goal. Here's how C.S. Lewis puts this in his classic book, Mere Christianity. He says, now the whole offer of Christianity that Christianity makes to us is simply this, that we can, if we let God have his way, come to share in the life of Christ. He says that God wants to invade us by what, Lewis says, by what I call the good infection. How, how, uh, How relevant is that in this current coronavirus crisis? Lewis says there, there's a virus that God wants to spread. It's the good infection of the life of his son in those that belong to him. And he says, by the good infection, every Christian is to become a little Christ. The whole purpose of, become a Christ, of becoming a Christian is nothing else. I think this is profound. He's saying that when you come to Jesus, it's not just to have your sins forgiven like you get a get out of hell free card, you tuck in your pocket and live however you want until you get to the pearly gates. That's not at all what the Bible holds out to us as a Christian life. It's that we are invaded with a new life and a new way of thinking that forms us into the image of Jesus. We become what Lewis calls a little Christ by the good infection. Now that doesn't, now now just in case you, you theologians at home are going, wait a second, wait a second, there's only one second person of the Trinity, Pastor Jeff. Yes, you're right. It doesn't mean that you become God. It doesn't mean you're on a level with God. What it's saying is God's purpose in saving you and redeeming you and calling you into him, to himself and to his family is to remake you into the image of his son, to populate the world with image bearers of Jesus. And our world needs that now more than ever. People growing up, in the way we think and the way that we live in the world, reflecting the beauty, glory, compassion, mercy, grace, and truth of Christ. That's what the church is here for. He saved you for that purpose. Let me state it this way. God's loving purpose and plan is to grow us out of spiritual infancy and into maturity in Christ. Say that again. God's loving purpose and plan is to grow you out of spiritual infancy and into spiritual maturity in Christ. That's what he's after. That's what he's all about in your life. And sometimes when we feel uh, disappointed, when we feel frustrated in our faith, when we were wrestling with God over things that we want, we're behaving like children and God is so patient with us, but yet determined to grow us up. The same way parents are with their kids when they throw a tantrum, when they freak out. You know, I I can remember one time, um, my oldest son, Noah, Who's, he's headed off to law school in the fall. You know, he's, he's becoming his, his own man. But when he was a little guy, he was fascinated with elephants. He was just like, uh, I don't know, kids have infatuations. And he would carry around part of a vacuum cleaner hose and called it his trunk. He called it his kunk. And he would carry it around wherever he went. Sunday school, Walmart, wherever he went, he carried this little piece of vacuum cleaner hose as his trunk. It was a little embarrassing. So I'm walking through the grocery store one time with him, and he's got that thing, and he's swinging it around, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm embarrassed. He does not care. He, he thinks he's an elephant. He's making sounds with his elephant trunk, you know? And, and what am I going to do? Rip it away from him, make him cry? No, but that's okay when he's five, when he's four. But, you know, if he's 35 walking around with a vacuum cleaner hose pretending to be an elephant, we might say he might need some help. God is, is patient with us in our little kid behaviors. He, he, he's not shaming you. But he has a better agenda for you. He wants to grow you up. Some of the things that are okay when you start out aren't so cute when you get older. And that's true spiritually as well. God wants to grow us up. 
Because this is why, by the way, the New Testament writers talk about the life of faith as being born again over and over. We've talked about this many times in the past. There's no other way to describe what happens when you come to Jesus other than to say you're reborn. And you're not reborn fully mature. With apologies to Benjamin Button, you don't start out as a fully mature adult. You start out as a baby. That's okay. But then you enter into a life of, of new growth. You get a new identity, a new nature, a new spirit, a new heart. And God grows you if you allow him. And part of our growth is, is learning how, how to stop resisting that work of God in us. How sometimes the things that are painful and hard are brought into our life for good purposes, to grow us up. Sometimes even awful things in the world which God does not cause and didn't bring, he can use in our own hearts to make us mature, to grow us up. But you have to grow up into this life. I don't know about you, but I've been thinking about this as I've been praying about this sermon. I need to grow up. I, even just last night with my own family, had some childish moments, if I'm honest, the way I behaved, the way I talked and acted. I was much more like this than like this. I don't know about you. I need to grow up. I want to grow up. And here's the good news. God wants that too. He wants that for you. You're not alone in your effort to grow. He is bringing that about in your life if you'll let him. And you know how when children grow, we make little marks on the wall? We make little marks each year that they grow. You might think of 1 Corinthians 13 as marks on the wall, as, as uh, the APGAR score for spiritual growth, because it's a description of Christ. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus does not envy or boast. Jesus does not delight in wrongdoing, but delights in the truth. It's a description of what love is. It's a person. It's Christ. And we're growing up into him. That's what God wants. And, and that's what he's after in your life. So let me ask you a question. How do young children learn and grow? How do kids learn language? How do kids learn behaviors? Two ways. Observing and imitating. That's how. We grow and we learn physically and biologically by observation and imitation. The same thing is true spiritually, friends. Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 11, earlier in this letter, verse 1, he says, Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Be imitators. So here's another question. Who are you imitating? Who are the people you are looking to for what maturity looks like? Who are the people that you're watching and saying, that's the kind of man I want to be. That's the kind of woman I want to be. Are they the right models? Are they imitating Christ? This is what we should be doing. And we have a culture looking at all the wrong people, the wrong models. Now, just as we wrap up here, the Greek word Paul uses for reason, when he said, I reason like a child, it's the Greek word elogizomai. It means to reckon, to account for, to think deeply about, to think something out. This is a, a mark of maturity, thinking, reasoning. Children don't think things out very well. They just react to stimulus, especially young children and babies. So the, one of the ways you know that you're growing spiritually mature is when you don't just react or overreact. You stop. You apply the gospel, you think it out, you go to God and say, am I seeing this right? Help me understand this. I've been doing that so much in these recent days. And the word there, the, uh, the reason, elogizomai, is the same word Paul used in Romans 8 when he says, I consider, elogizomai, that the present sufferings of this life are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed. That's spiritual maturity. I see present sufferings but I'm not just reacting to those things. I'm considering, I'm thinking them out in accordance with the gospel, and I recognize that they're actually not worth comparing to what is to come. This takes work. Infants and children are easily tricked, easily deceived. Paul tells us here to give up childish ways, both behaviors and thinking, and to grow up. Let me read to you how the Apostle Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 13 through 15, as we will finish with this verse. He says, Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves. Oh, I love that. What's God after? Not just you individually growing up, but his people growing up into unity in the knowledge of the Son of God, 
the full knowledge of who Jesus is that invades our minds, our hearts, and is expressed in our lives. So that we're not infants who are tossed back and forth by every conspiracy theory or latest thing on Facebook or uh, false teaching that pops up in our culture. And it's, it's just everywhere. Politically, economically, socially, there are so many ways we are deceived and tossed back and forth by the waves. Let's learn together to stop acting like babies and to grow up into him, the one who is love. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we confess to you that though we might be physically grown, spiritually speaking, we still act like babies. We are still immature in our minds, in our behaviors. Lord God, would you, by your grace and mercy, grow us up into you. Conform us to the image of your son. Change us, transform us. We need it and we want it and we trust that it's what you want for us as well. We pray this in your name and for your sake. Amen.